In this video, I'd like to discuss a communication principle called media ecology, and uh, and what this the overview really is that that uh, that media, meaning channels or mediums through which we communicate, uh, are affected by humans, and vice versa, they affect human communication and interaction. So, uh, media ecology just tries to describe that relationship and and define that relationship a little bit. And so let's go back to the beginnings here. Media ecology really started with a guy named Marshall McLuhan, uh, who's a very famous communication theorist and very well known in the 60s and 70s, even in pop culture, really. So Marshall McLuhan came up with uh, a lot of things, but one of the things he, he kind of uh, outlined for people was this idea of technological determinism, what he called technological determinism. And this was back in the 60s, and he published his most famous book in 1964, so that'll give you just a little time frame. But technological determinism basically said that a society's technology determines its cultural values, its social structure, and its history. So that technology is the is the driving force sort of behind those things, and really... Um, plays a large, large role in defining cultural values, social structure, and history. And McLuhan theorized that social progress really is driven by technological innovation. And we'll talk about some of the different ways that he he thought that was true here in just a second. But that social progress, that technology was really the driving force, the main force behind social progress and social structure. And finally, he said that, that this theory really examines the effect of technology on the nature of human relationships, and that a part of technological determinism is that it, it, it has such a large impact on the way that we communicate, the way that we relate to one another, um, the way that we uh, engage one another, and has just a tremendous impact on cultural values, which we'll talk about here in just a second. So McLuhan basically said that technology has evolved through, at, at that time, it was four periods of history. Now we've added really a fifth, and, and some theorists would say six, but okay, we're going to stick with five today. So, but in McLuhan's time, there were four, really. And so let's talk about each of those here. In McLuhan's media history, there were four periods or, or stages of human development. Uh, really, what he called the tribal age was, was, was pre-literacy. It was before the development of the written word, even, and so in the tribal age, really, you had cultures that were um, uh, were developed and, and dependent on um, oral communication, okay? spoken word communication, the, the way that you uh, learned history, the way that you knew how to do anything, the way that records were passed down, was all through the spoken word. There was no uh, written word at that time, so there was no way to pass messages or pass history down through. Uh, written words. So, uh, and, and that did affect, he, and McLuhan theorized, he said that this has a major impact on human interaction because it, it makes every individual really dependent on the tribe. Right? And, and so we have in intercultural communication what we would call collectivism, right? This collectivistic mindset where everybody's kind of, kind of dependent on one another, and if you stray too far from your tribe, you're going to be in real trouble because you're going to not have anybody who speaks your language and understands your same culture and your history because they haven't heard it. There's no way to pass that around and no way to share that with other people. So so, so really creates this sort of dependency on the tribe and really close-knit collectivistic mindset culturally where we're all we're going to stick close to home, we're all going to work together, uh, and, and nobody's going to upset the fruit basket, so to speak. Right? And so um, there's this mindset of what's best for the tribe is best for me. And so you don't have a lot of focus on individual achievement and things like that relative to today's standards. You wouldn't have as much of that uh, in the tribal age. So, okay, again, this is all before the development even of the written word. Uh, but then the written word comes along, right? The written word comes along, and, and then we enter what, what McLuhan called the literacy age, where there was written word and there, you had the ability now to, to kind of uh, store history in in, language, in words on paper, instead of having to have it passed down through oral tradition there, you could uh, have it stored on paper, you could record history, you could send messages for uh, greater distances, so that meant people that didn't, people didn't necessarily have to be within shouting distance of the tribe in order to be a part of that and to, to, to share uh, what was going on and, and have an understanding of what was happening. You could send messages across a further distance, so people were able to kind of get away from the tribe a little bit and still be part of that tribe, still be connected um, if they were literate and could understand that. So significant differences there in the way that we relate to one another, still largely collectivistic, um, still pretty dependent on the tribe, but you had that ability to kind of separate and spread, spread apart a little bit um, from the, the tight-knit group there. Then the, maybe one of the 
most significant impacts of technology on communication period in, in the history of the world was the inventing uh, of the printing press. The invention of the printing press uh, by Gutenberg or wh whoever you want to attribute it to. Um, it, it, the invention of the printing press really did have a fundamental impact on the way that we relate to one another and, and things. So, and, and this is what McLuhan called the print age. So after the invention of the printing press, we're able to mass produce things, which is important because now we have multiple copies of things and we can really um, ensure that that history is going to survive as opposed to you know, having one person, a monk or a scribe or whoever, take four years to write this document one copy at a time and then have to preserve that as it's so precious. There aren't very many of them, right? Now we have the print age where we can start to just mass produce things. But more significantly, uh, the, the print age really increases the literacy of the world population. Prior to the printing press, because materials were so hard to get, um, it was really only the, the really wealthy or typically people who were worked in religion. So people who were, you know, priests and monks and things like that learned to read because it was important for them. So if you, but if you were outside of, you know, the religious uh, sector of the world, if you weren't a priest or a monk and you weren't fabulously wealthy and had the ability to afford uh, books and things like that, then you couldn't read still because they were so hard to come by, right? And not in the literacy age. But now in the in the print age, we have a situation where books are readily available. They're, um, uh, they're, so you have mm, everybody really can access these things. And so now everybody can begin to learn to read. Now, of course, not everybody does learn to read, but, but you have many, many more people, especially at the sort of the commoner level. Um, and, and we can look at the, the development of, of religion as, as a sort of a, a, a you know, micro view of this in terms of the many people would theorize that or would, would tell you that the invention of the printing press really eventually led to the protestant revolution because now more common folk were able to read they weren't as dependent on the church to understand the bible they could come to their own conclusions they could they could uh, you know develop their own thoughts because they could read it on their own and they weren't dependent on somebody else and that led to more of a division from the tra traditional church the catholic church if you will in that um, where, where that structure was, everything had to flow through the church and through the priest. Now people could start to do it on their own. And so you have, a, but more broadly, in the print age, again, that ability to kind of separate uh, from your main tribe, so to speak, and still have that knowledge that comes from being able to read, the, the knowledge of how to do things and what's happening in the world and what your history is, without having to have come from oral tradition uh, and and being right there with your tribe. So, yeah, I mean, just, you know, for example, the folks that came from um, Eastern Europe, or sorry, from Europe to, you know, from, from England and from the Netherlands and wherever in France uh, to the uh, Americas, the, the first settlers in the Americas, setting aside the Native Americans here, but the people who came from Europe to settle in America were able to do so in a sense because they, they could take that knowledge with them and they could take that connection with them without having to be right there with their people at that time, right? They could take the books and, and still have that knowledge and still have the history and still have the learning and, and get more over because you could have newspapers and books and things sent over. So they were able to really you know, cross the ocean and still be connected there. But still, but then you have, you know, more and more the development of what, would, what we would call the um, individualistic mindset uh, of, the, of the settlers of the United States, for example, who were, instead of being connected to that tribe and thinking, okay, what's good for the tribe is good for me. Now we have this mindset of, I'm responsible for myself. If I want a house as a settler in the United States, if I, if I want a house, I'm going to have to cut down the trees. I'm going to have to, you know, mill the lumber. I'm going to have to build the house. And then I'm going to have to start farming the fields and do it. And this is on me. This is, but so, so we have the start of developing, you know, individualism there, um, which leads to innovation in some ways, right? Because if I'm going to have to farm my own fields, eventually people said, I need to be able to do this in a more, uh, you know, in a, in a quicker fashion. So you have the development of tools to do that, right? Development of machinery to help you do that. And eventually development of things like the combine and things that allow one person now to farm you know, thousands of acres as opposed to one person farming a couple of acres and feeling pretty good about that because it's a you know, backbreaking work to do so. Anyway, this idea of individualism comes from through this print age. And so because this separation allows us to start to be more individualistic and I think so. Um, so, and also allows for separation though. So now you can see we've gone from the tribal age to the print age. No longer are we just 
absolutely dependent and, and interwoven and connected with that tribe, now we're on our own as individuals. Okay? And, and so our communication changes then, right? Our nature, the nature of our communication with others changes as a result of that. Eventually we enter what McLuhan calls the electronic age, development in his time of radio and television and things, um, which in some ways has the, uh, the effect of allowing us to separate even more, because right? now we can get things immediately through these things electronically and not have to depend on others, um, but at the same time brings us together, because now we're all really sharing the same information and creating what, what McLuhan called a global village, because we're all, you know, again, sharing that same information, we're all uh, on the same page there. So, uh, and then eventually we would add a new age onto this, obviously with the, the advent of the internet and social media and things, it's changed things tr dramatically. Uh, so we, we're now in what's called the new media age, and there's still some ongoing uh, searching about what that means for us in terms of McLuhan's media history and things, but, you know, again, the enhancement of this global village. But, so this is all McLuhan. And, and another aspect of, uh, and that's tremendously important for us and what we're thinking about and how we relate to others uh, in the in the manner of technology, but... Um, so another thing that McLuhan gave us, though, is this idea of the medium is the message. And medium remembers a channel. It's a channel. It's how we uh, it's how we communicate with others, the tools that we're using. So he said this, the medium is the message. This is merely to say that the personal and social consequences of any medium, that is, of any extension of ourselves, result from the new scale that is introduced into our affairs by each extension of ourselves or by any new technology. Uh, Easy enough, right? Simple to understand. So, no, I mean, that's a little, that's a little complex. And there are a lot of things that go into this idea of the medium is the message. But, but, you know, if I can simplify it just for a second for our purposes and what we're talking about here in terms of mediated communication and how it impacts us, one massive takeaway from this is that uh, how we communicate with others matters because it sends a message to them. You know, the, the, the method through which we choose to communicate sends a message. If you're trying to get a really critical message to somebody, um, is you know, putting it on a post-it note and sticking it on the fridge the right way to do so? Maybe not, because it's going to get you know, knocked off the fridge and it's going to get shuffled under there or whatever. They may not see it anyway. So, so we may need to choose a different medium. And in choosing that medium, though, if, if somebody sees that we've left them a post-it note, they're just going to assume that the, that's not a tremendously important message or you would have chosen a different medium, right? So the medium is the message. How we choose to communicate this information um, says something about what we feel about that message, what we feel about that person, and so forth. So, in this instance, that's what we're what we're going to focus on for the medium is the message. Okay, so McLuhan's work is followed up uh, by a guy named Neil Postman, who really comes up with this uh, idea of media ecology, and kind of uh, connected to, but kind of moving a little past technological determinism into media ecology. Postman said that uh, media ecology uh, defines communication and defines technology as a it's a more holistic systems-based examination of the symbiotic relationship, meaning the interconnected, interwoven relationship between humans, technology, and the environment. Uh, it, it, it's a, the aim of media ecology is to increase awareness of the mutual effects, right? And so it's a dynamic process rather than focusing on technology as that singular driving force as it does in technological determinism, right? Technological determinism, it's technology that really is pushing uh, society forward and shaping society. And Postman says in media ecology, really it's it's not so much a one-way thing like that. It's a dynamic process. Uh, and so he chose the word ecology very intentionally. And actually McLuhan uh, was the one who first used media ecology, but, but Postman selected that as the focus of his efforts um, it, intentionally because, it, you know, we think of it like an ecology, like you would have here in, this is the, you know, the plains of Africa, where you've got this symbiotic relationship between the animals, and, and then the animals and the environment, you know, and, and, the, and it's all interconnected. If you, if you change one thing, you pull one thing out, it's going to be different. Yeah? So whereas media, technological determinism is this cycle where, you know, technology evolves and then humans adapt and so forth, and you can put that on repeat, technology driving that forward. Media ecology really says that, you know, we have these, that we have this mediated communication, these new tools are developed, and then we adopt them, and it becomes more of a normalization. But in the middle of that, then is human communication, which is also Im impacting all of those other things, right? So really, what we're talking about here is the fact that uh, we have this relationship with technology, and it, it pushes us, but also we define it and drive it. And so we need to understand um, that, that the nature of that, again, symbiotic, interconnected relationship with technology and, and the impact that that can have on our view of communication. As always, if you have any questions, 
don't hesitate to email me. I'm always happy to answer 